Good morning and welcome to Morning Scoop for Thursday, April 28th. This is your Daily Buckeye Fix. I'm Tom Moore. The Notre Dame game is in 129 days, the game against Michigan in 213 days. Tonight is the first night of the NFL Draft, and there should be at least three former Buckeyes who will find out where they'll be starting their professional careers. We're going to be talking about that a little later on on today's show. But there was also some big news with the Ohio State basketball program, as Malachi Branham announced Wednesday that he was going to stay in the NBA Draft and leave the Buckeyes after just one year. My guest today is Kevin Noon. He is the host of the Big Me Kickoff podcast. Kevin, we talked about Branham earlier this week, and in the end, I don't think this was a big surprise to either of us. No, I mean, I think that as the year went on, it became a little bit more of a surprise. Um, I can kind of go back to Mike Connolly Jr. He's going to be here a couple of years. Oh, it's questionable. Oh, there's no way he's coming back. And that's kind of the the progression with uh, Malachi Branham. Uh, it, it, during the press conference that he and Chris Holtman had on Wednesday, uh, you know, they talked about not hitting a freshman wall, and that was very important for Branham. I mean, not everything was perfect along the way. There certainly were some some growing pains, but all of the uh, all of the reports that they got back from the NBA certainly were saying not only first round, but a, a better part of the first round. I would say the teens. Uh, you know, he's just somebody that just never really seemed to completely bog down for long stretches. And we're only seeing the scratching of the surface of what he's going to be capable of doing. And this is going to give Ohio State two first-rounders in the NBA draft, which uh, you know a lot of people have been critical for one reason or another of, of you know maybe what Ohio State's been able to do under the couple years of Chris Holtman. But you know this should be something that people will not be able to refute. Yeah, that, that's something that probably pays some dividends down the line in recruiting one way or the other. Yeah, Brandon, Brandon was someone who I, I was right there with you. You know, he was, he didn't seem, you know, it seemed like certainly, certainly he'll come back next year. Certainly he'll come back next year. And he put his name in the draft and he started to the mock drafts come out and he's going 10th or 12th or 14th. And it was like, ooh, I don't know that he is coming back after all. So as soon as you started seeing that, you kind of tell which way the wind was blowing. Uh, now that he is officially gone, there is one more spot to fill in the roster for this year. Where do you see them looking? You know, at least at least positionally, if not a specific person, but at least sort of in terms of position, where do you think they spend that final scholarship for the uh, upcoming season? Well, I think they need to look at two things, and then I'll make my pick uh, feet to the fire. I think they need to look at a point guard, somebody that can bring the ball up the court, uh, kind of have the offense run through them. And then I think they need to look for a big. And when I say a big, I don't necessarily mean – 6'11", seven seven-footer, but wouldn't that be something? Because it's been a minute since Ohio State has had that type of, of player. Uh, you know, apologies to Ibrahima Diallo, who just never really played during his run with the Buckeyes. Um, when it's all said and done, I think they need to go with the big. Uh, you certainly, you know, putting a lot of pressure on Bruce Thornton as one of your primary ball handlers next season as a true freshman. I think there's some other guys who are going to be capable of bringing the ball up the court. I mean. Let's remember, uh, Magic Johnson, uh, even back at uh, Michigan State, was bringing the ball up the court, and he certainly was not your traditional point guard. So you don't have to be a six-one guard to necessarily be the guy doing that. Uh, you know, it's a team that has a lot of guards, and and you know, it, it's heavy on twos and threes. Um, you know, we had the announcement, you know, within the last couple of weeks that Seth Towns was coming back. Obviously, Justice Suing is coming back. So, I mean, they've got some guys of a certain size, but I'd like to see somebody who is kind of a combo four or five type guy out there that can that can put some points up. Because Ohio State, by way of the portal, has gone out with with, with Sean McNeil, with Tanner Holden, has got some scores. You know, get somebody that's going to create, you know, give you some size, give you some length, help you with your spacing. I think that's the, the direction they need to go. There are a lot of names still in the portal. It's still very guard heavy out there. Uh, you know, if the perfect guy shows up, you got to do what you got to do. But I would be looking at at guys that are fours, uh, stretch fours, maybe because Ohio State really hasn't had a traditional center in some time. All right, so that's enough NBA draft and NBA draft adjacent talk. Let's talk a little NFL draft that is coming up tonight. So we're we are uh, we're on the clock. So are the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, last week, you put together a really comprehensive mock draft of that first round, and like all mock drafts, I'm sure 100% guaranteed to be accurate in every single pick, so good job with that. Uh, but there were a lot of really intriguing things in there that I wanted to talk to you about before the actual dra- draft happens tonight. 
Um, before we get into the Buckeyes, who you might hear their names called tonight, the thing that jumped out to me about this year's class is, I, I mean, I don't want to rain on anyone's parade, but this feels like a really down year for quarterbacks. They're just, there is not a Justin Fields. There is not a Trevor Lawrence in, in this year's quarterback class, is there? Yeah, this is not the strongest of quarterback classes in terms of having those top end names. I mean, there there's some intriguing names in this quarterback class. Uh, Malik Willis, the uh, former Liberty quarterback, uh, he's the guy who intrigues me the most. Uh, I really kind of like somebody like Pete Carroll ending up with him. I think that he could do a lot of things with this guy. I don't know if he's somebody that you can just trot out there immediately and say go. But how many guys can you throw to the Wolves like that? I mean, even the Bears with uh, Justin Fields had Andy Dalton and you know Andy Dalton didn't necessarily have a lot of success but with that offensive line neither did Justin Fields or those receivers or anybody really associated with the Bears and that's why they have a new head coach because that program has a lot of issues um you have uh, Desmond Ritter out of Cincinnati who I'm seeing really kind of as a a second round which would be a second day type of guy uh, and then you've got Kenny Pickett, the quarterback out of Pittsburgh, and his tiny hands. Uh, you know, I don't buy as much into all of that, but I'm not I'm not one of those front office guys that goes through all of the little data points. But I think a lot of Kenny Pitt, Pickett's success is predicated on the fact that he was like a 32 year starter at Pitt. I think I think they handed the ball over from Dan Marino to Kenny Pickett over within that organization, and I think I, I, you know, I've, I've read a lot of people saying, oh, he's a really safe pick. Well, I think he's the exact opposite. I think it's a highly risky pick. I just am not sold on that one. Hi, Mr. And Mrs. Pickett. If you're watching, sorry to be talking so ill about your son. Yeah, he'll, he's going to be making more money than either of us are in about 24 hours. So he's, he'll, he's doing just fine regardless. So uh, the first Buckeye, someone else who's going to be making a whole bunch more money than us in about 24 hours is Garrett Wilson. You, he is the first Buckeye you have coming off of, off of the board. That's at number eight to the Falcons. And that's, I mean, it feels like that's sort of about where the consensus is building for him. Um, why is Garrett Wilson a good fit to Atlanta? So there's a lot of debate whether or not he's going to be the first receiver off the board. I mean, I, I think that more and more of the draft experts are coming out believing that he may be. There are a lot of programs that do need receiver help. And the thing, too, is there's a big thing in terms of economics. When you sit there and you see receivers making twenty million dollars a year, and if you can go and get somebody on a first year, a first uh, you know first go around contract, either with a you know four year or five year, with, at a very fixed cost, you're going to go out and do that. I mean, some guys are going to end up pricing themselves out in terms of veterans. I think Garrett Wilson is a true number one receiver. He's got the speed. He's got the catch radius. He's got the he runs great routes. He gets the separation. I think he really encompasses everything, and I and I think that he's just one of many great receivers in this draft class. I mean, when you look at guys like Jamison Williams and 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 Drake London, and obviously that other guy from Ohio State, among you know, I could keep going at the position. Um, you know, I think that he can go to a Falcons program that really is looking to try and find some things. I mean, it's we're we're a long way removed from twenty eight three for them, so uh, you know. Maybe they can have the same type of success with him that they had with another former Buckeye that went there early in a draft, Michael Jenkins. Yeah, you may uh, you may remember Michael Jenkins from uh, shockingly like twenty years ago. It's uh, I was just thinking about Michael Jenkins the other day when I saw this, and it was like, oh man, that was a long, long, long time ago. Um, you have another former Ohio State wide receiver, Jamison Williams, going just a couple picks later, number ten to the Jets. First of all, how dare you do that to poor Jamison? I mean, you know. Sorry, not sorry to our good buddy, uh, Alex Gleitman, who is a big Jets fan, but uh, that is that has not been traditionally a great spot to get drafted. It's also pretty high for a guy who just suffered a pretty significant knee injury in that national championship game. Why do you think he's going? It, it, do you really see him going that early? I was, I was wondering if that knee injury might slide him down the board a little bit. A lot of the reports that I've heard is that he's ahead of schedule. I mean, not every ACL injury is the same. I mean, it's just kind of how it is. And I also believe, too, that, yeah, he's going to be somebody you're going to have to redshirt to a certain extent. I mean, OTAs are not necessarily something that are going to be on the table. Um, what if he wasn't hurt? Would he be the number one overall receiver in the draft? Well, you know, quite possibly. Um, and I want to jump in before people are watching being like, 
Yeah, but he he was he couldn't even beat out Jackson Smith and Jigba at Ohio State. Well, you know, I think that that's some some creative storytelling there. I mean, everything happens for a reason, and it worked out fine for everybody. Um, but you know, Jamison Williams certainly is that type of home run type of target. But I mean, he's not just he's not like Devin Smith, who was a a, a deep ball only type of receiver. I mean, he's somebody who who can run most of that route tree, do a lot of things out there. And, um, you know, I do get concerned about durability issues. I mean, a knee injury is a knee injury is a knee injury. And they say that when you get your ACL repaired, it's stronger than your natural one. And, you know, I, I hope so for his, I mean, for his sake, I like covering Jamison Williams, good kid. Um, somebody had to go to the jets and, uh, at least he's not their first pick. Kayvon Thibodeau, the former Oregon defensive lineman. I have him going there with their higher pick, but, uh, yeah, that really seems to be kind of the prevailing belief that I have right now. Yeah, Jamison Williams. When you say Jamison Williams is a uh, was it was a great kid at Ohio State and very liked by his teammates. I had a uh, long running series on uh, Twitter where there would be pictures of other people scoring touchdowns and Jamison Williams looking the most excited of anyone in the picture. Like he was always so happy for his teammates when they were scoring. He was uh, yeah always always a very uh, very popular figure on the team and uh, yeah so he's. He's someone that Ohio State fans should be feel feel good about uh, about continuing to to uh, support. Uh, the third former Buckeye you have in that first round is another wide receiver, uh, Chris Olave. Uh, side note: I'm starting to think that Brian Hartline might be okay at his job in terms of talent evaluation and development, but uh, we'll get to that maybe on a later show. Uh, you have Chris Olave heading to a team that has had a whole lot of Buckeyes in recent years, the New Orleans Saints. So why why is he a good fit there? Yeah, and I have him going there 16, the Saints pick at 16 and 19. I mean, you could you could kind of flip-flop these. I guess it depends on what type of run you have on receivers, whether or not the Saints are concerned that either the Chargers or the Eagles or somebody moves up and maybe takes uh, Olave off the board from them. Obviously, the New Orleans Saints know a thing or two about drafting Buckeyes and picking up Buckeyes. I mean, they've they've had plenty of Ohio State players on that roster. Obviously, Michael Thomas signed at the one point, the most lucrative wide receiver contract out there. I mean, they had Ted Ginn Jr. there for quite some time. I think that I think that with Thomas coming back, I think that Olave certainly takes a lot of the focus off of Thomas. And if you sit there and you put all the focus on Thomas, Olave is going to run wild. If you put all the focus on Olave, which is saying a lot for a first-year guy, then Thomas is going to get you. Um you know, they're they're looking to move on from the Drew Brees era. I think that you sit there and you give them kind of a Swiss Army knife and Chris Olave that can do pretty much everything really well. That's that is a, a huge safety net for a team that really is still trying to move on from a Hall of Fame type quarterback. And our audience obviously has a lot of overlap with the Browns and Bengals and Steelers fan bases, and the Browns do not have a first round pick this year because of the Deshaun Watson trade, but you have the Steelers taking someone who our audience is very familiar with, Michigan defensive back Daxton Hill. So what makes him a good fit for the Steelers? Because it feels like the Steelers have more needs than they typically do this time of year. They do, and with it being such a weak quarterback class, I didn't want to go quarterback there. I think that they can address that. In other ways, um, you know, they need help in the back end. I think that Daxton Hill... I mean, I think he's a safety that has some corner skills. I think he was pretty much the best player available in terms of positions that they needed at that time. Um, we want to talk so much about Michigan's defense last year, that being Hutchinson and Ojabo, but Daxon Hill did a great job in in his position. I just, I just really think that it ends up being a good fit. I think that he has the type of vers- versatility to work within that system and. You know, he was a player that Ohio State desperately wanted coming out of high school as well. So, I mean, he was somebody that I followed pretty closely. And I think that, uh, I think to him, the, uh, you know, having a, having a brother who has done a lot of this already before going through the process, I think that Daxon Hill is prepared better than, than many for making the jump to, to playing on Sundays. All right. And uh, if you watched any Bengals games at all last year, even the Super Bowl, uh, you know what the big need on that team is. So with the 31st pick in the first round, you have the Bengals starting to address the uh, the very, very big need. Not not fin- not doing all, the, all, all that they need to do, but at least starting to address it. Who did you predict, uh, project the Bengals taking there in that 31st pick? Yeah, I had them take uh, Iowa uh, center Tyler Linderbaum. 
the Bengals have already addressed a lot of offensive line via free agency. So I really kind of looked at cornerback too and say what you will. I think that there's a, there are a lot of people that like to see them insulate the, themselves a little bit more from having Eli Apple out there every play. So I looked at corner, but Tyler Linderbaum was one of these situations of, okay, if, if corner is position need one, uh, offensive line is still one a and you have an all American type of guy in Linderbaum, somebody that you can kind of plug and play at center, uh, for 10 years, hopefully you just, you just don't pass them up. You don't, you don't move down and try and reach a little bit more on, in terms of, of a corner to make that happen. I think that the corner draft is deep enough that you can get into the second round and not necessarily be in a position of where you're struggling. And, you know, you're talking about the Bengals, a team that made it to the Super Bowl that, that, you know, had more than a puncher's chance of winning that game. Uh, you know, teams turn around so much because of free agency, but there weren't a lot of huge pressing needs. And I think that a, a pretty strong refresh of the offensive line is going to go a long way. That definitely, you know, if you watch Joe Burrow get sacked was it, nine times against the Titans, like, I mean, that, that's uh, that, that he is a, uh, an incredible quarterback, but at some point you're going to want to make sure he's upright to be able to do his incredible stuff. So, uh, yeah, the offensive line definitely needs a little work. Corner, I, yeah, I was, I'm with you there too. Needs a, needs a little work there as well, but uh, they're picking a little later than they normally would in the first round. But, you know, in the NFL, that, that's a good thing. So, Kevin, uh, thank you as always for joining me. Well, uh, you can find, uh, I'll have a link to Kevin's full mock draft in the uh, post for this pay, uh, for this show on the front page of BuckeyeScoop.com. So you can go through all the picks and see where some of the other guys, uh, some big names from elsewhere around the Big Ten and uh, around the country ended up in his mock draft. And then you can uh, make sure you uh, print that out, be uh, scoring along at home while you're watching the draft, and make sure you let Kevin know every time he got a, uh, got a pick wrong. Uh, you can reach out to him on Twitter for that. I'll put his uh, link to his Twitter account in uh, in the, the uh, front page post as well, just to make sure you are adding the right person to tell him he got everything wrong. So great job as always, Kevin. Thank you for joining me. Uh, one last thing to hit on before we leave. Went from the Bengals needing offensive linemen. Well, the Buckeyes need offensive linemen too. Uh, and someone we talked about on yesterday's show, offensive lineman Austin Surveld, he announced that he would be making his college decision next Wednesday. The Buckeyes, Notre Dame, and Alabama are his three finalists. So we'll have... Uh, a little more information on what Ohio State's offensive line class could look like uh, middle of next week. So one more thing to sort of keep an eye on in addition to the NFL draft. So that'll do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.